The Bible says that you shall know truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth isn't something. The truth is someone. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. He isn't trying to be the truth. He doesn't have good intentions of being the truth. He is the truth. Recognize that spiritual strength is greater than physical strength, and your thoughts are heard in heaven. The greatest battlefield upon which you will fight and must win is the battlefield of the mind. If you are in a time of spiritual warfare, the Bible promises, I will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. If God be for you, who can be against you? If you're in a storm, keep rowing. If you're in a fight, fight to win. If you've been knocked down, you're not defeated until you stay down. Get up in Jesus' name and fight the good fight of faith and win. There's not a victory without a fight. There's not a sunrise without a night. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. So press on. Endure. Adversity does not make a man either weak or strong. But adversity reveals to you what's in you. The Lord is my light and my salvation of whom shall I fear. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my strength. Of whom shall I be afraid? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount on wings of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. For our minds focused on Him gives us a rock rib confidence that endures no matter what the circumstance in life happens to be. We serve a victorious Lord, and we are the church triumphant. Thank you for joining us this morning at North Broadway, and thank you to uh, everyone joining us online this morning. We uh, actually have a lot of people away uh, this week, uh, March break and vacations and people down south, but uh, thank you for being here today. Today's message is entitled, The Battle of Your Life, and we are in the battle of our lifetime, and this is a battle that we must win. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 this morning, if you want to turn there. And Holy God and Father, we just bow before you now and we just thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Lord God, that you are in control in heaven and in our lives you reign sovereignly. And Lord God, we just ask this morning that by the presence of your Holy Spirit, you would be here with us this morning, that you would... Speak your word to us this morning, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man in the earth and was grieved in his heart, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The scriptures describe in a time in history where 
people have become incapable of hearing the words of God or following any thoughts but their own. And we at this time must be aware that Satan is coming against this generation in an unprecedented measure. He's attacking this generation and taking the thoughts out of the minds of an entire society. He's doing it in our government. He's, he's doing it in our school system. In a lot of cases, he's even doing it in the house of God, trying to eradicate everything that comes from the mind of God to blind an entire generation, to take captive as, as many as he can. For the scripture says that he knows his time is short. We have examples of this in history to show that this can happen. These people in, in the book of Genesis were not that far from the testimony of God through creation. They would have the stories. They would have uh, the, the, the knowledge, the, the lineage, and many have throughout history. But they allowed something to take over, the fallen nature of mankind. The fallen nature that became part of mankind from the day sin was committed in the Garden of Eden. And this this manifests itself through the thought that I can be as God. And I can determine for myself what is good and what is evil. And I don't need God to tell me what the parameters of acceptable behavior are. I can determine that on my own. And that is exactly the battle that we're in. And just as Satan came into the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve and tempted with this thought, and they stepped outside the parameters of the protection of God, and look at the heartache that came into the world because of it. Look at the heartache that came into their own family when one of their sons became a murderer and murdered his own brother. The battle for your soul begins in your mind. If Satan can control your thoughts, he will control your destiny. The Bible says that the devil is the father of lies. And Jesus says he was a murderer since the beginning. He only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Pastor Doug touched on this last week here. The devil never, he never paints the whole picture. It's always just a little piece of the canvas, and and it's always the piece that's got the sunshine in it. He never paints the whole canvas. He never paints the side that has death, decay, despair, depression, addiction, hopelessness, broken families, tears. He never paints that picture. If you turn with me to Romans chapter 1, we read about a society, what they look like when it falls into spiritual decline, when people no longer and can no longer hear the words of God, when a rebellion gets a hold of of a people, whether it's through ignorance or it's deliberate or just neglect. Paul writes concerning the moral decline of any society that chooses to follow in the same footsteps as those living in the days of Noah did. He writes of of this progression of God's judgment on a society. It's It's a timeline of events of God's judgment on a society that does this. Starting in verse 18. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Underline that. By their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is manifest to them because God has shown it to them. Listen. There is a spiritual decline in our society right now like never before. I'm not going to go into fine details, but what once was illegal in our nation is now encouraged. What once was morally appalling is now invited into our children's schools and libraries. What once was a safe television network is now teaching our kids how to summon demons. What once were reliable news networks 
providing reliable information have become nothing but political platforms for liars and propaganda. This generation that we're living in has seen a major moral decline. We are watching an entire generation being taken captive by ungodly thought and moved away from what, from what makes a society strong and a people virtuous. Verse 19 says, For what can be known about God is manifest to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You see, here's the point. They did not want to retain God in their knowledge. They wanted the name of God eradicated from their society. They wanted everything that would remind them of the one who blessed them taken out of their way. And we see this over and over again in our society. God comes and he he sets a people free and he gives blessing and and power and he gives knowledge and understanding and we we do the same thing as many have in the past and we say thank you thank you for what you've done thank you for what you've given us but you can go now we've got it from here we know how we want to handle this verse 29 they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness evil covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. Now listen to this. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. These are people in positions of leadership. People of authority in government. People of influence, Hollywood. They're not only committing the sin, but giving approval. Changing laws. Redefining embracing their sin, not facing their sin, embracing it, flaunting it, taking pride in it, embracing it as their DNA, as their genetic makeup, as their identity. They love it. This is exactly where we are in our society today. This is where we are on the progression of judgment that Paul has laid out in this chapter, this timeline of God's judgment on a rebellious society. Right now, people are sitting in government, and, and many of those we've trusted to teach our children. Although they, they know how God feels about sin, not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Not only making things acceptable, but making them legal and funding them with taxpayer money, not only embracing and encouraging sin, but shaming anyone and punishing anyone who disagrees with them by their unrighteousness suppressing the truth. Anyone who has a differing opinion, anyone who who dares to voice their convictions, they are bent on teaching our kids that they, they have no true identity. They have no true origin No true purpose. 
hurling them into this lost life of confusion, depression, and pain right from the get-go. Young children. Not wanting God in our thoughts, it'll always lead to the same place. The pattern's there. The history's there. It's not hidden. We know it. We have the history of it. And we've seen what happens to other societies in the past who have who've done exactly what our society is doing right now. In the days of Noah, God looked down and, and he was sorry. We're told this in his word. We're, he was sorry that he had created. And the scripture tells us in, in Matthew chapter 24, it's Jesus talking. And he's, and he's saying, as the days of Noah were, so will the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And in this chapter, he's, he's talking about the return of Christ. And he likens it to the days of Noah, what a society it will look like. Listen carefully. This is Jesus talking. As in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. They had no idea how short their time was. Every day, passing by this huge ark, which was a testimony of God sitting right before them. In this, and, and it was a place of mercy, prepared for anyone who would have received it. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And I can see Noah standing there inviting people into this place. But, but the, the people of the society around him, their thoughts were so encapsulated in rebellion against God that... He, even though they could recognize that this was something supernatural, this was something that they were invited to take part of, but they couldn't embrace it. They had no idea. In their minds, they were, they were doing good. Jesus says they were marrying and given in marriage. In their minds, they were committed. They were committing one to another. What possible issue could God have with this? They were feasting as if there was a million tomorrows. Do you know how close we are to the return of Christ right now in this generation? The Bible tells us that we don't know the day or the hour, but it says that we're not children of darkness, that that day should overtake us as a thief, meaning you're going to recognize the season. Do you understand that we're right at the threshold of the return of Christ? Just look at this insanity in Russia with Ukraine, China, North Korea, Iran. These are world powers. Nation rising against nation. Pestilence. Hello? Earthquakes, calamities coming upon the earth just as Jesus said they would. All leading to this definitive moment. Folks, the ungodly know. There's something in the hearts of people that knows there's something different about the generation we're living in. We're living in what the Bible describes as the season of Christ's return. And we need to live with this expectation in our hearts. Even in the church, there's a dullness. Not all, thank God, but in many places, people inside the church are just as blind as the people outside. In Daniel chapter 5, we read about the last kingdom, sorry, the last king of Babylon. His name was Belshazzar. He had a history and he knew God. God had dealt with his, his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, severely. God showed that the, the kingdoms belong to God and, and God sets on the throne whom he chooses and he removes from the throne whom he chooses. And that knowledge was not hidden from Belshazzar. The Bible says Belshazzar knew this. In other words, he knew better. And, and yet, he still chose to take the holy things of God and, and that had been removed from Solomon's, taken from Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And he threw a feast for all of his friends and all of his family. And, and they put wine in these vessels and they began to party. 
They praised the gods of gold and silver and stone and wood. Then suddenly, this hand appears on the wall. And it's a, it's a, it's a supernatural hand. And they know that, that God's trying to speak to them. But nobody in the room can understand what it says. And that's what happens when you take lightly the things of God. That's what happens when you take lightly the cross of Jesus Christ. When that kind of a spirit gets a hold of God's people, they can open the book, but they can't understand it. When Jesus Christ is just an add-on to an already set in motion life plan, when Jesus is just on your mind on Sunday mornings and forgotten about the rest of the week, you can open the book, but you won't understand it. That's what happens with so many people sitting in churches these days. That's what is happening in this generation, how unaware they're going to be, how caught off guard they're going to be when all hell starts to break loose and they stand up in their congregation and they say, Preacher, you, you lied to me. You told me if I came to Jesus, it'd be nothing but health and wealth and, and, and happiness and prosperity and a bigger piece of the pie. You lied to me. So these people, they called for Daniel. And Daniel came and, and stood before King Nebuchadnezzar and all of his friends and mighty men. And he said, here's what God's word says. You've been weighed in the balance. And you've been found wanting. And God has numbered the days of your kingdom and finished it. And even though you stand in this place of power and authority, your kingdom is over. Now the interesting thing, Daniel stood there and the words of God were clear. There was no misunderstanding. There was no amb ambiguity. Okay? And, and King Belshazzar, he knew better. And, and he could recognize truth, but strangely couldn't hear it. He could recognize it. You can be sitting here this morning and recognize that what you're hearing is truth. You can sit here and agree, but, but strangely, not be able to make any changes. Not be able to say, my ways are not God's ways. It's an aff strange affliction that happens to those who've played games with the things of God. They recognize truth, but they have the lack of ability to make changes. So Daniel, he's standing here before Belshazzar, and you have to understand, the kingdom of Babylon is the most powerful nation in the world at the time. King Belshazzar could have had Daniel's head on a platter like that. But Daniel stands before Belshazzar and, and he says to him, your kingdom is over. Your, your season of ruling is finished. Your military might is not going to save you now. And he, and he stands before Belshazzar and says, your kingdom is done. It's been given over to someone else. And what does Belshazzar do? This must have been so mind-boggling for Daniel. He says to those standing around him, promote Daniel to the third highest in the kingdom. Put a gold chain around his neck. Put robes on his back. So here's Daniel standing there, and this foolish king was honoring and decorating him while the enemies were right at the gate, recognizing and, and decorating and honoring a man who spoke truth, yet unwilling to bend his knee to what he was hearing. And that very night, the kingdom was attacked, and King Belshazzar was killed. And that ended the Babylonian Empire. It's history. Psalm 10 says, The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. If you are able to be under conviction, thank God for it. If you are living in sin and you're bothered by it, thank God you're bothered by it. That means that God is still in your thoughts. God is still fighting for you. Let them win the battle. That's why the Bible tells us multiple times, and, and Pastor Doug uh, touched on this last week, 
Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you can still hear God, do not harden your heart. If God is still in your thoughts, if if God is still fighting against the things that want to occupy your mind, if you feel that there is a war going on inside your head, thank God for the war. We all struggle. You're not alone. We all struggle in our thoughts. Despair knocks on every door. Lust comes to every mind. We fight in our minds, but the difference is with a true believer, God is in our thoughts. There's a battle going on. God is with us in our thoughts. He's he's touched with the frailty of our weakness. He's not angry with you. He's not standing over you as a judge. He says, come to me and let me help you. Come quickly to the throne of grace and let me help you. God is with us in our battle. He promises us victory and power to withstand the downward pull of this fallen generation. And there is a huge downward pull in this generation. We are living in a time very much like Daniel's. Time when, when idols and expectations are, are being raised up of what man says society should look like. And when you hear the music, you better bow or you're going to suffer for it. God is the one who can give us the power to stand. God is the one. 2 Corinthians 10 says, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every high thing raised against God, the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are mighty. The weapons of our warfare come from faith in the victory of Jesus Christ on the cross. He gives us the power to pull down these thoughts that that try and raise themselves up and exalt themselves before God. James says, Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Translation, resist him, and resist him every day. Fight him, and fight him every day. It's been said, if the devil reminds you of your past, you go right ahead and remind him of his future. He hates that. The Bible says that you shall know truth, And the truth shall set you free. The truth isn't something. The truth is someone. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. He isn't trying to be the truth. He doesn't have good intentions of being the truth. He is the truth. Stop letting the devil tell you that you can't. And start believing God that you can. I can walk in the light of Scripture. I can walk in the truth of God. I can stand in an evil day. I can be given authority to make a difference even though everything around me looks like it's going the other way. It's so important to win the battle that we are in. We are in the battle right now. And this is a battle that we must win because we are all that's left. Heather and I were doing some planning for kids' ministry a number of weeks ago, and and we had this conversation about what's happening in the world, in our society, and what our children are being faced with at such a young age in schools and in every aspect of their childhood. And we asked the question, what can we do about it? I mean, it it seems so insurmountable, this problem. It seems so hopeless. Listen, we are all that's left. There's no political party. There's no new preacher. There's no, no one except the church. This world's on a collision course with Almighty God, and there's nothing to stop it from where it's going except you and me coming in boldly to the throne room of grace to say, God, I'm not just here for myself. 
I'm here for my family. I'm here for my church. I'm here, God, for this city and for my friends, for my children. I'm even here for my enemies. I'm here in the name of Jesus Christ to cast down the thoughts that are holding them captive and keeping them from the salvation that is freely offered to them. That's why we need to pray like we've never prayed before. And for some of you, maybe that means just starting. It's an hour to come into the throne room of God. It's an hour to be filled with faith. It's an hour to stand up like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood up to King Nebuchadnezzar and said, no deals with you. It's an hour to come into the throne room of God. Not in our strength, but in our weakness. Not with a record of the history of the, our faithfulness, but in recognition that God's mercy has covered everything we've done to offend his name. Coming in with recognition of our own poverty and need. Not coming in with arrogance. Not coming in knowing everything. But knowing this one thing, that there is only one name under heaven whereby man must be saved. Coming in believing that when you pray, God hears you. It's time for you and I to go down on our knees and petition God. We need to pray for this next generation who most of them don't even know who God is. They don't even know He exists. They're being attacked and lied to. We've come to the very threshold of being a godless country. It's time for us to make a decision. As Joshua did when he stood before the people of his day and he said, Choose! Choose this day. He didn't say, Go home and think about it. You know, sleep on it. Talk to the kids. Talk to the wife. Let me know. Get back to me. Choose this day. You go to any Bible bookstore and all the merchandise they sell has this verse on it, it seems like. Coffee cups, posters. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose whom you're going to serve. Choose to stand. Choose to be a light. Choose to be a man or woman of prayer. Choose to read your Bible. Choose to be in good relationships. Choose to do things God's way. Choose to live within the boundaries of the Holy Scripture. Choose it with all your heart. This is how we're going to win the battle. As the people of God, it's so important that our minds become shrouded in this book. As Paul said, whatever is of virtue, whatever is of good report, whatever is praiseworthy, Whatever is lovely, think on these things. And the God of peace, listen to this, will crush Satan under your feet. It's time to get out of the seat of the scornful. It's time to put aside our personal preferences. It's time to stop playing, our way, playing away our time on things that don't matter. It's time to make our priorities right. It's, it's time through the, the power of the Holy Spirit to help the church go forward. You have to understand how important you are to the kingdom of God. Every single one of you in this room and online, you're important to the kingdom of God. You are the only one that stands between your family and the judgment of of God. Do you understand that? The church of Jesus Christ is the only one standing for the eternity of those in the community that we're living in and, and for these children in the next generation. They're all going to a Christless eternity. Do you understand? You're the only one left. There's no one else. They're not going to hear it anywhere else. So don't underestimate the power of your prayers. Don't underestimate what God can do through you when you stand in obedience to Him. All things are possible to those who believe in the power of Almighty God. We are in the minority as Christians, but I want to remind you all through history, Moses, 
Esther, Daniel. And the list goes on and on of God waiting until there was no chance but his own intervention. And all he wanted and all he searched for was someone who would believe it. Someone who would come into his presence and say, I don't care if they throw me in the fiery furnace. My God is able to deliver me from the fiery furnace. And even if he doesn't, I'm not going to bow to the evil of this world. One of the best lines in the Bible. With all the other ones. I pray that there's going to be an awakening where people just wake up. Where the church, in a lot of cases, just wakes up and begin to realize I got to get right with God. I need to use what little time I have left to live in obedience to Him. I need to, I need to pray for my loved ones. I need to read his word so I know truth in a time of great deception. The devil fears you going to prayer and faith. The devil fears a surrendered life because his kingdom's been destroyed and demolished by it several times before. He's been around a lot longer than you and I. And he knows what happens when someone surrenders their life to the purpose of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can do nothing and get nothing from heaven without faith. Salvation comes by faith. Peace, love, and joy come by faith. By faith, God will help us to win the battle that we find ourselves in. The thoughts that that sway us so easily. Like, I just want to be happy. I just want to live in comfort. I want my kids to have what I never had. None of them on their own are a bad thing, but when that occupies your mind all day long. Or maybe it's, I struggle in some areas of my life and and the devil tells me that I'll never get the victory. It's never going to change. If you had only just gone to university, if you had only just not taken that first sip of alcohol, But that's not what God's Word says. Today, by faith, you need to trust God and go in the direction of His Word. You need to trust that He'll be your strength. Trust that He'll be your comfort. Trust that He'll be your provider, your protector, your deliverer. Trust that He'll stand at your right hand. Trust that He'll never let your foot slip. Trust that He will deal with your enemies. Trust that He'll be your high tower of refuge. Today, church, remember that you are in a battle, whether you like it or not. And as long as we're still here, as long as we're still here on this earth, the church must go forward. And the battle must be won for the sake of your children, your grandchildren, for the sake of your siblings, your spouse, your neighbor your co-worker, the community that we're strategically placed in. Church, we're all that's left, and the battle must be won. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just thank you so much that we do not depend on our own strength that you are still in control, you're still on your throne in heaven, and you still have a plan for redemption for all of mankind. And it's not your will that anyone should perish, but all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask that you would continue your work in us here at North Broadway, in your church around the world, and that there would be revival in the hearts of mankind. Lord, we thank you for this time this morning. We pray that your, the words that were spoken this morning will echo in our hearts all week long. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Let's stand as we close this morning.
Faultless to stand before 